In the middle of the previous century, flying saucers were constantly making headlines. America was going through a surge of reported UFO sightings. So, it shouldn't probably come as a surprise that the American authorities, namely the U.S. Air Force, created a couple of short-lived programs. Those were Project Sign and Project Grudge, and their main goal was to look into that phenomenon. These programs were followed by likely the most famous of them all, Project Blue Book. It was a large-scale government study that lasted from 1951 to 1969. The initiator of this program was Major General Charles P. Cabell. He was a former intelligence director of the Air Force. Project Blue Book scrupulously gathered over 12,600 reports about people seeing bizarre unidentified objects in the sky. After thorough research, it was determined that most of those had natural, quite mundane explanations. As for the rest of the reports, the members of Project Blue Book simply didn't have enough data to evaluate them. That's why support for their efforts dwindled. Officially, Project Blue Book was closed in December 1969. But apparently, it didn't make American authorities lose interest in UFO sightings. Because in mid-December 2017, the world found out that they had secretly launched one more UFO research program in the late 2000s. Accordingly to certain documents, American authorities spent around $22 million over a four-year span on a project called the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, aka AADIP. This project was started in 2007, and its main goal was to study UFO phenomena. Most likely, all this activity was triggered by the 2004 Tic Tac incident. That's when a few U.S. Air Force pilots spotted unidentified flying objects off the coast of California. They captured them on video. None of the pilots could figure out what these objects were. They behaved in a weird way, as if our laws of physics didn't apply to them. They were reportedly flying extremely fast and rotating in unpredictable movements. It looks as if after that incident, American authorities decided to investigate whether those objects could be identified or not. And if not, they were eager to know where they had come from and if they had been a threat. When the New York Times story about the new project broke, officials announced that the study had been terminated in 2012. Uh, however, there were people who claimed that the program was still ongoing. One of those was a military intelligence official running the program until they quit in October 2016. In any case, let's have a closer look at this mysterious program. Indeed, the areas of research funded by the project resembled things you could find in Star Trek. For example, one grant was for the study of traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy. This study was conducted by Eric W. Davis of EarthTech International Inc. Another grant sponsored the research of invisibility cloaking. One more area of study included warp drive, dark energy, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. This research was conducted by a theoretical physicist and director of the nonprofit Icarus Interstellar. As we've already mentioned, all these studies received at least $22 million of funding, but this sum could have been much bigger. No one has revealed why or how these studies were given such huge grants under the AATI program. The results of the study aren't known publicly either. The criteria for choosing these fields of research could be that warp drives and stargates might be useful for extraterrestrial civilizations traveling interstellar distances to visit our planet. Still, some people are not amused that such questionable fields of study were receiving substantial government funding. How about I tell you that aliens might exist? I know it probably goes against everything you believe in, but it's a new model of the universe that could explain how intelligent life spreads and distributes. This model makes lots of predictions. For example, we should expect to meet another civilization at some point. It also mentions our chances of starting to get messages from aliens, or even becoming an interplanetary civilization ourselves. This model also explains why we haven't met other space civilizations yet, considering the huge number of stars and galaxies in the universe. But let's go into detail. 
The main assumption of the model is that, at one point, a civilization existing in the vastness of the cosmos can become grabby. You see, there are two types of civilizations. Quiet aliens don't actually try to expand. Neither do they change much. And after some time, they just disappear. That might be the reason why we don't have any data about them. And all that is left to do is to make speculations about their existence. But there are also loud aliens. They supposedly keep spreading really fast until they meet other space civilizations. The model also calls these loud aliens grabby. That's because they expand from their home planet at a fraction of the speed of light. They also make significant and visible changes wherever they travel. And they last for a really long time, too. Why might we suppose that grabby aliens exist? Because their existence may be the most plausible explanation for why humanity appeared so early in the history of the universe. See for yourself. The current date is 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. Small stars can burn their cosmic fuel for up to a trillion years. And according to the standard model of the origin of advanced life, it's more likely to appear at the end of the longest planet lifetimes. Well, grabby aliens might be to blame for our early appearance. Such civilizations could set deadlines for others. If such aliens indeed exist, they will occupy most of the observable universe really soon. And when they succeed, no other civilizations will be able to appear because all the habitable planets will already be taken. A civilization like ours, advanced but not grabby yet, could only appear early because later it wouldn't have a chance to do it. There's another reason why the idea of grabby aliens seems plausible. Look at life on Earth, like humans. Aren't we grabby in many ways, too? Species, cultures, and companies tend to expand and occupy new niches and territories as fast as they can. For example, species spreading on new territories get access to new resources and thus increase their population. Why shouldn't we expect the same behavior from extraterrestrial civilizations? The main author of this model, Robin Hansen, was also the first to introduce the idea of the Great Filter in 1996. According to the Great Filter theory, the universe is filled with countless life forms. But people haven't stumbled across any of them yet, because somewhere, there is a Great Filter. The main purpose of this filter is to stop and finish those civilizations that advance to the level of star colonization. Suppose that this idea is true. There are three possible scenarios for our civilization. The first one. We're unique because we have passed the Great Filter. Other civilizations haven't managed to make it this far. The second scenario goes like this. We're among the first potential colonizers. Before, the conditions in space were too harsh for life forms to leave their home planets. In this case, chances are high that we'll soon encounter other civilizations. And the third scenario is quite worrying. We haven't reached the level of technological development that is advanced enough for the filter to locate us. This means that we haven't passed the filter yet. In other words, the trial is still ahead, and it's a big question if we manage to pass it. One of the best and most convincing pieces of evidence that extraterrestrial civilizations have visited Earth could be the epic Nuremberg space battle of April the 4th, 1561. It was recorded either in 1561 or 1566. Different sources provide different information. All the retellings of this story focus on the woodcut picture and a vague summary of events that occurred that day. The emphasis is always on crashed spaceships and space battles. Almost everywhere you read or hear the story, it goes like this. The inhabitants of the city woke up early on an April morning and saw a staggering celestial show that looked like a real space battle. This story sounds even more convincing when you find out that some objects allegedly fought for quite a while. And some even crashed, you can see them in the lower right corner. Look at the picture once again. Orbs and crosses fighting, a giant arrow and bizarre tubes, crashing ships. Wow, that had to be a spectacular cosmic battle. To make it all more plausible, Hans Glazer, the artist behind the woodcut, was a very real person. He really did woodcuts, and this one is indeed from the time and place that it says it is. 
meaning it's not fake, and it does depict a real event that had its own witnesses. For all intents and purposes, it looks like very convincing proof of aliens visiting us. But don't get your hopes up. A superficial perusal of facts seems to confirm an extraterrestrial presence on our planet. But the most likely explanation is much more mundane. The Nuremberg 1561 UFO battle is just an atmospheric phenomenon called a sundog or parhelion. A sundog is a concentrated spot of sunlight that can sometimes be seen to the right or to the left of the sun or even on its both sides simultaneously. Sundogs often appear as a pair of patches of light with subtle colors at the same altitude over the horizon as the sun. They can have a variety of forms, from colorful spots to patches of light so intense and bright, it looks like there are two additional suns in the sky. Sundogs are weird looking enough to make it seem that something scary and otherworldly is going on in the sky. At the same time, it's just our planet's atmosphere or ice in the upper parts of the sky acting as a prism or reflective device. This prism makes the light from the sun or moon do weird things. This image can help you visualize the phenomenon. Apparently, Nuremberg had the perfect conditions for this phenomenon to occur. If you examine the depiction of this event and compare it with modern pictures and videos, you'll soon realize that a sundog is indeed a more likely explanation than the galactic empire paying us a visit. Let's find the proof of this statement in the translated description of these events and in the woodcut picture itself. First, the sun showed and was seen with two blood-colored half-round strokes, like the diminishing moon right through the sun, and in the sun, above, under, and on both sides, stood blood-colored and partly bluish, or iron-colored, also black-colored round orbs. Now here's the photo of a sundog. It has a halo surrounding it, and a red orb. And if we have at least one red orb, there could be others showing up during other events. Plus, keep in mind that sundogs are like prisms. So, depending on how light is reflected, there could be multiple colors present during such a phenomenon. Now, referring to circled plates mentioned in the description, those could be halos. For example, this sun halo looks vaguely plate-like, and it seems to be linked to other sun halos. And indeed, people have seen halos with multiple orbs. Some of the orbs could have taken a cross-like shape. If we watch some modern videos of sundogs, we might notice that the orbs on film are sun-colored. But since the Nuremberg event happened between 4 and 5 a.m., the clouds and the sun could have had reddish and orange hues. As for the fighting, it could be as simple as one shape moving a bit and changing shape along with the movements of the sun. It could have looked as if it was pushing the other shapes out of the way. Do you agree with the scientific explanation? Or do you prefer to think that Earth was visited by guests from a galaxy far, far away? Write your opinion in the comments. A shocking theory claims that mysterious comet Oumuamua might be a von Neumann probe, an alien spacecraft with broken engines tumbling through our solar system. It sounds extremely unsettling, but first things first, what is a von Neumann probe? Mathematician John von Neumann suggested the concept of self-replicating spacecraft that could in some ways mimic the features of living organisms or viruses. People started to refer to such hypothetical spacecraft as von Neumann probes. Von Neumann was sure that using self-replicating spacecraft would be the most effective way to perform large-scale mining operations, like mining asteroid belts or moons. The creators of such probes could take advantage of their exponential growth. Hypothetically, a self-replicating spaceship could be sent to a neighboring planetary system and look for raw materials there. Such materials could be extracted from moons, gas giant planets, asteroids, and the likes. Using these materials, the probe could make replicas of itself. The replicas could then be sent to other planetary systems, and the original probe could pursue its main purpose within its parent star system. This pattern sure does repeat the reproduction patterns of bacteria. That's why some experts think that von Neumann machines could be considered a form of life. There's also a theory that a self-replicating spacecraft could spread throughout a galaxy the size of the Milky Way in just half a million years. 
even if it used conventional theoretical methods of interstellar travel. In other words, it wouldn't even need to employ exotic faster-than-light propulsion. In 1981, mathematical physicist and cosmologist Frank Tipler argued that extraterrestrial intelligence couldn't exist because people had never observed von Neumann probes. Even if we take a moderate rate of replication, such probes should already be common throughout space. So, it's really weird that we haven't come across any of those yet. It might only mean that extraterrestrial intelligence doesn't exist. A response to Tipler's arguments came from astronomers Carl Sagan and William Newman. They pointed out that Tipler might have underestimated the rate of replication, and von Neumann probes should have already started consuming most of the mass in our galaxy. Therefore, any intelligent race would avoid designing von Neumann probes in the first place, and try to destroy any probes as soon as they found them. Another objection to the prevalence of von Neumann probes is that civilizations that could potentially design such devices have an extremely high probability of self-destruction before producing such a machine. In any case, the assumed capacity of von Neumann probes is unlikely in reality. But then, how about Oumuamua? These days, scientists are using high-tech scanners to examine a huge, cigar-shaped comet, which might or might not be an alien probe. One idea is that it's an extraterrestrial civilization spacecraft, with broken engines wandering through our solar system. If that's the case, the object could easily be a von Neumann probe. Dr. Jason Wright from Penn State University thinks that a broken alien spaceship could move in exactly the same way as Oumuamua. Rather than moving through space like other space rocks, the 1,318-foot-long, 118-foot-wide space traveler is tumbling through the solar system. At the moment, it's traveling at a speed of around 200,000 miles per hour. In his blog, Dr. Wright says that if such derelict craft were not traveling fast enough to escape the galaxy, they could thermalize with the stars and end up drifting around like an interstellar asteroid or comet. They wouldn't have attitude control anymore and would eventually start tumbling. And it could distinguish them from regular interstellar asteroids. Plus, even though their propulsion was broken, their radio transmitters could work just fine. In any case, so far, it's just a theory. And further research is needed. What do you think? Is Oumuamua just a space rock or an alien space probe? Hi, my name is Martin. I am the author of this channel and today I'll tell you all about the evidence of astronauts meeting with unidentified things at the time of observation. It's the year 1962. An American John Glenn is orbiting Earth in his Friendship 7 capsule on the Mercury Atlas 6 flight. He looks out of the window and sees... Fireflies. Well, maybe those are not fireflies. But he clearly sees some weird bright specks clustered around the ship. Unsurprisingly, he tries to find a logical explanation. Can they be ice crystals from the spacecraft's hydrogen peroxide attitude control rockets? But Glenn is unable to correlate their appearance with the use of the rockets. The mystery remains unsolved. Only much later will we find out what those fireflies were. You see, spaceships tend to accumulate clouds of debris and contamination around themselves. And when Glenn's rockets spread jets of crystals, many of these crystals accumulated in the cloud. They reflected sunlight and interacted with other gases, looking like tiny sparkles. The case of the mysterious fireflies is now officially solved. But it isn't the darkest space tale. One of the most famous cases of seeing bizarre stuff in space comes from Apollo 11. That's when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins noticed a UFO pacing along with them during their flight to the moon. That's how the astronauts describe this incident. We did watch a slow blinking light some substantial distance away from us. There was something out there, close enough to be observed. The period of uncertainty was rather brief. The astronauts and ground control soon identified the object. It was one of the four adapter panels that fit between the third stage and the lunar module. 
These panels were ejected from the third stage, and one of them continued along the same trajectory as the lunar module with the crew. While moving, it rotated and blinked when sunlight was reflected off its surface. Another famous and truly creepy picture hinting at the presence of alien life on the moon was taken by the crew of Apollo 16. As the astronauts were leaving our natural satellite, they made a video, and four seconds of it showed a near-perfect Hollywood flying saucer leaving behind a plasma trail. For more than 30 years, enthusiasts used this video to prove that aliens had paid us a visit. But then, scientists decided to take the matter into their own hands. They realized that, when viewed from the window through which the video had been taken, the object in the film was actually consistent with a small floodlight sticking out from the side of the capsule on a boom. Look, from this angle, the floodlight looks exactly like a flying saucer. And the boom, indeed, looks like that plasma trail. And do you see this? Those are a couple of bolts on the boom. Another report that inspired UFO enthusiasts came from Gemini 7. Astronauts Frank Borman and Jim Lowell were making what was called a football maneuver. It was supposed to get them into a position where they would make recurring close approaches with their Titan to booster stage every orbit. But when they were performing this maneuver, Borman reported bogey at 10 o'clock high. We have several, looks like debris up here, actual sighting. We also have the booster in sight. Yeah, have very, very many. Look like hundreds of little particles banked on the left out about three to four miles. It looks like a path to the vehicle at 90 degrees. They are past now. They were in polar orbit. Lovell claimed that the booster was in sight too, slowly tumbling along with the debris cloud. Does it mean that Bogman's bogey particles couldn't have been the booster or booster debris? After all, they were moving in a different direction, traveling along a different trajectory. Well, not necessarily. Later analysis showed that those particles were ice flakes from leftover fuel from the Titan II. As you see, astronauts often report seeing weird stuff out there. But NASA's reaction is often anticlimactic. Let's have a look at how they commented on the statements of an astronaut who claimed to have witnessed alien presence in space. NASA doesn't track UFOs. NASA is not involved in any sort of cover-up of alien life on this planet or anywhere else in the universe. We should also remember that unidentify doesn't necessarily mean positively identify as an alien spacecraft. There's a lot of objects in orbit and a lot of stuff travels along every mission. So, we'll always have UFO reports as long as we have space programs. We could use one of the largest lasers in the world to detect alien spaceships. If aliens existed and managed to make a spacecraft as huge as Jupiter, our equipment could probably detect it using the ripples its warp drives would produce in space-time. You see, an enormous spaceship is bound to produce gravitational waves while moving around. You can read about a warp drive, also called a drive-enabling space warp, in science fiction. This device distorts the shape of the space-time continuum and is one of several ways of traveling through space. It's often described as similar to hyperspace, a faster-than-light method of interstellar travel. A spaceship equipped with a warp drive can travel at speeds greater than the speed of light by many orders of magnitude. But unlike some other fictitious faster-than-light methods of travel, like a jump drive, it doesn't permit immediate transfers between two points. Instead, it involves a measurable passage of time. A spacecraft using a warp drive would still keep interacting with objects in normal space and produce gravitational waves too. That's why, if any extraterrestrial gigantic spacecraft traveled through our galaxy, the Laser Interferometer, Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, in the U.S. might be able to detect it. Its equipment could search for the ripples in the fabric of space-time left by the spaceship. The bigger an object is, the larger gravitational waves it would leave. Planets, neutron stars, and even black holes produce quite prominent ripples. 
For the first time, such space-time ripples were directly detected in 2015. And since then, scientists have been getting better and better at spotting gravitational waves. New calculations published at some time ago suggested that LIGO could look beyond conventional sources of space-time ripples. The authors of the study claimed that colossal alien spacecraft traveling at high speeds or pushed along by warp drives could also produce the telltale vibrations. The LIGO detector notices gravitational waves from the tiniest distortions they make in space-time when passing through it. The observatory consists of two intersecting L-shaped detectors, each with two arms that are almost two and a half miles long. They also have two identical laser beams inside. The experiment is designed in such a way that if a gradational wave passes through our planet, the laser light in one arm of the detector gets compressed while the other expands. It creates a minuscule change in the relative path lengths of the beams arriving at the detector. At the same time, the warpings of space-time that even the largest gravitational waves make are barely noticeable. They're often the size of a few thousandths of a proton or neutron. It means that LIGO is incredibly sensitive and requires precise maintenance and calibration. To check how far this sensitivity can stretch, researchers made calculations of the smallest object that would produce clearly detectable gravitational waves on Earth. Apparently, it would still be pretty big. To be detectable by LIGO, an alien spacecraft would need to weigh roughly the same as Jupiter, be within 326,000 light-years away from Earth, and travel at one-tenth the speed of light. Could spaceships of this scale and speed exist? It's unclear, but hopefully, scientists will be able to squeeze down the ship's size to slightly more reasonable proportions thanks to the increasing sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors. For example, in the mid-30s, the European Space Agency's laser interferometer, space antenna, is going to be deployed. Scientists also think that advanced alien warp drives could create a gravitational wave patterns distinguishable from natural sources. If detected, these alien waves could probe at use with answers to how to reverse engineer the technology. All because the shape of the gravitational wave signal is dependent on the trajectory of an object. Once a burst signal is detected, we could attempt to figure out the qualities of the transportation mechanism used there based on the shape of the gravitational wave signal. Hi everyone! Today we'll be talking about the controversial music that astronauts once heard in space. A few years ago, NASA made public the recording of a bizarre music that the astronomers from Apollo 10 reported hearing in May 1969, while they were flying over the far side of the moon. At that moment, they were out of radio contact with Earth. This happened months before the first astronaut set foot on the lunar surface. There were three people on board, Thomas Stafford, John Young, and Eugene Sermon. The sounds lasted for about an hour. Astronomers managed to record them and transmit them to Mission Control in Houston. Now, I want you to listen to these whistling sounds. That hit music even sounds outer spacey, doesn't it? Did you hear that? That whistling sound? Yeah. Don't they resemble some kind of otherworldly outer space music? So the question is, could the astronauts have heard alien music coming from outer space? Well, there's another more simple, non-alien involving explanation for this cosmic phenomenon, but we'll talk about it a bit later. In the audio recording from the Apollo 10 mission, astronaut Eugene Sermon, who was piloting the lunar module, could be heard asking John Young, piloting the command module, if he could hear that whistling sound. Sermon was the first one to call these sounds music and to add that they were kinda outer spacey. Later, when the two astronauts asked Tom Stafford, who was in the lunar module with Sermon, if he could hear the sounds too, he confirmed it and stated that they were really weird. Jan suggested they should find out more about them. Nobody will believe us, he added. Apollo 10 was a mission that paved the way for Apollo 11, which landed two humans on the lunar surface. The Apollo 10 astronauts flew to the moon in a command module. However, two of the crew members also had a ride in the lunar module, which allowed them to drop down to less than 10 miles above the moon's surface. So, since they managed to approach our natural satellite so closely, could they have heard something coming from the lunar surface? Well, apparently not. Turns out that the creepy whistling sound was nothing more than some interference between the VHF radios on the two different vehicles. Interestingly enough, Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins later wrote in his book 
carrying the fire, that NASA technicians had warned him about the whistling. He also mentioned that if he hadn't known about the origins of his music, it would have scared him to no end. In 2008, NASA shared the transcripts of the Apollo 10 transmission, but according to the documents themselves, they were declassified in 1982. In 2012, NASA also shared the audio files online. If you listen to these files, you'll hear that the astronauts sound sincerely odd and puzzled by what they hear. Moreover, they bring it up over and over again. It's also worth mentioning that you never actually feel that the three men were panicked or alarmed while going over the transcript or the audio. Some sources put particular emphasis on the fact that the space music started when the astronauts were over the far side of the moon. They didn't have radio or visual contact with mission control for about an hour, something that had been expected. Some documentaries used this moment to create tension by saying things like the astronauts were on their own, no one on Earth could see or hear them. However, the narrators never explained why the astronauts' isolation could have been such a significant factor. By no means was it connected to the not-so-mysterious sounds and their soul. There's another interesting element to this story that we should consider, though, and it's the fact that Apollo 10 astronauts never discussed this incident and the sounds publicly. However, it's still unclear whether they talked about it with NASA engineers. This makes some people speculate that the astronauts didn't want to project anything but a rock-hard psyche, showing a drop of confidence even once during the whole mission could have left them out of the whole project. Our galaxy is home to 200 billion stars and maybe 100 billion planets. Let's imagine that life exists on a tiny fraction of those places. And let's imagine that those lives could evolve into intelligent beings. Given that, it would seem safe to say that our galaxy would be populated and some species would be actively trying to find us. We have an equation called the Drake Equation that can estimate how many intelligent civilizations might arise in our galaxy. The equation suggests that there should be around 20 civilizations just on the outskirts of our galaxy. So why haven't we encountered any of them yet? The work of Frank Drake a radio astronomer published in 1961 is a set of many variables, such as the average number of planets in a solar system that could potentially harbor life or the rate at which stars are suitable for intelligent life form. The complexity here is that astronomers have yet to determine the exact values of these variables, meaning that our calculations are still only approximate. Recent discoveries in these areas give us hope that we can refine these estimates. Let's use our hypothetical assumptions and apply them to our galaxy. Let's crunch the numbers that comes up to at least 20 civilizations. Yet, somehow, the sky remains strangely silent. How did this happen? Some people think that the appearance of life is a rare event. Others think that the transition from bacteria to highly developed beings is a difficult step. Still others believe that civilizations may either destroy themselves after a short lifespan or may never even invent something with which they could communicate. But there is one theory that surpasses all the others in its creepiness. The Dark Forest Theory. According to it, the universe is a vast cosmic version of a haunted forest and other kinds of beings are out there somewhere playing hide and seek. They are deliberately keeping silent. Why? Well, for starters, every form of life wants to survive. If we start with that assumption, we can ask the question, will other forms of life harm you if they have the chance? So, the safest option is to destroy them before they find the right time to do the same to you. Frankly speaking, this is a cosmic version of survival of the fittest. In this scenario, Making contact with others becomes the most dangerous game, as it could lead to your location being tracked down and you being destroyed. The theory was proposed by scientist David Brin as a possible explanation for the lack of radio evidence for the existence of life. But how realistic is this theory? Only one advanced race behaving in this way could answer that question. So far, this theory explains why we are not picking up any advanced radio transmissions despite a century of listening. It is possible that other beings like us are too afraid of being noticed and have deliberately gone silent. It is worth considering that there may have been a point at which everyone decided to keep quiet. Was it an aggressive civilization that deliberately wiped out the noisy aliens? The question is open. 
For about a century now, we have been those very noisy aliens. Any other civilization within a hundred light years of us can receive our signals and know exactly where we are. And if we have reasons to hide from them, as some people, such as Stephen Hawking, suggest, we may already be in trouble. So, will we ever receive a message from our cosmic partners? Only time will tell. But what we do know for sure is that we cannot just brush this off. We cannot allow panic to spread across the planet when we receive that alien WhatsApp. We need to have a plan, and we need to have it ready by the time we are faced with the real situation. The U.S. authorities have investigated over a hundred cases of strange phenomena occurring in the sky. No little green men have ever been found, more likely drones and similar objects. Whether our intergalactic neighbors will send us a message tomorrow or centuries later, we need a plan. After all, this could change everything we know about our universe and our place in it. Without knowing languages, people from different countries won't be able to communicate with one another efficiently. And imagine if some extraterrestrial civilization sent a message to Earth. How would we figure out their intentions? Like, do they want to get to know us better? Or is it a warning about a full-scale intrusion? It must be terribly hard to bridge the gap between us and creatures whose minds, bodies, and habitats are totally different from ours. So, to practice decoding potential extraterrestrial messages, an artist-led group created a mock message from stars. It was the most alien missive the world had ever seen. Even though it was written for humans by humans, it was as non-human as possible. The message was sent from Mars to Earth, and three observatories detected the transmission 16 minutes later. Unfortunately, so far, no one has deciphered the message, but many have been trying to do it. There are only three people in the world who know what the message means. One of them is the project's founder, Daniela De Paulis. She and two other co-authors created the message after consulting with scientists, poets, programmers, and philosophers from all over the world. The main challenge for them was to get rid of anthropocentricity to make the message as realistically alien as possible. So the team immediately ruled out any kind of language-based communication. Even though now, they refuse to confirm or deny that the message contains text. The creators were also considering using mathematics. Yes, the fundamental concepts of this science are universal, but different cultures may represent math differently. DePaulis and her team struggled to compose the message for years, experiencing massive writer's block. But eventually, in 2019, the idea was formed. Three years later, in 2022, a major breakthrough occurred when the team drew inspiration from a short story called A Sing in Space. And a month before the transmission, an astronomer joined the team, adding a mathematical touch to the message to make it more universal. Since the first announcement, the project has attracted loads of puzzle lovers. They started to exchange ideas, hoping to solve the mystery. Some of them were among the first people to extract the raw message from the ExoMars orbiter's broadcast. It was a 40 gigabyte string of numbers interwoven with the alien message. If it had been real, it would have arrived unannounced, of course. But in this case, the signal came at a precisely scheduled time. Now imagine peeling layers off an onion, that's what filtering the data segment looked like. But after a week's effort, the enthusiasts received an image of five speckled clusters against a blank background. After that, the speculation on the meaning of this picture started. Could the message be hinting at the alien's appearance? Was it Morse code? Maybe it hid some genetic secrets? One user even enlisted ChatGPT to help decipher the message. There was also a theory that the image was a star map with the location of the alien civilization. Another suggested that the dots resembling constellations could be molecules. Probably, they were part of the biosignature of the foreign world. But decryption is the process of making sense of some message for which only the intended recipient has a key. That's why this kind of code breaking is much more difficult than decoding, because you need to guess the missing key. Another tricky part is where to start. Every attempt feels like a stab in the dark. You might believe that you have started to see patterns, but you need to stop and think whether it's true or you're just projecting. The community is still trying to decode the message. At the moment, there are more than 30 ideas for how to do it. 
Only after that can people try to understand its full meaning. How about you? Would you like to try and take part in the process? Maybe you've got some idea? Then share them with us. Have you heard of quantum immortality? These days, many people are confused about this notion. But if you believe in it, you also believe that you can live forever. How come? Well, quantum immortality claims that nobody ever disappears forever and that consciousness never passes away. Instead, once you cease to exist in one universe, your consciousness simply gets transferred to a parallel universe, and there, you survive. This idea sounds more like a sci-fi movie than something that real science can suggest. It could be a script for a blockbuster. People's consciousness can transfer from one world, where an apocalyptic event has wiped out all life, to another, where such an event has never occurred. And the only clues about the slight differences between these worlds are a few Mandela effects. This phenomenon is named after people disremembering Nelson Mandela's passing. These days, the term is used to refer to any collective false memories. So maybe in that new world, millions of people will be wondering, since when has Pizza Hut been written with two T's? But the thing is, in this new reality, this popular brand name has always had two of them. Imagine going through apocalypse after apocalypse, transferring to one world after another. It might be a nice, if a bit horrifying, thought that you're going to live forever. Instead of passing away completely, you'll just keep transferring to a universe where nothing tragic has happened to you. But is there anything to this theory? What does science think about such a possibility? In fact, the idea of quantum immortality has been around for quite some time. It has been seen both as untestable nonsense and as a curious thought experiment, like the one involving a cat. And here, I mean Schrodinger's cat. Let me explain. According to one of the interpretations of quantum mechanics, particles can exist in several states at the same time. But when a particle is being observed or measured, this system collapses. As a result, the particle is found in just one of its possible states. In 1933, Schrodinger suggested doing a certain thought experiment. He believed it would show the absurdity of this idea. In his hypothetical scenario, a cat was placed inside a box with radioactive materials. These substances had a 50-50 chance of decaying over an hour. If it happened, the radioactivity would be detected by a Geiger counter, which, in this case, would smash a vial with poison. As you might assume, it wouldn't end well for the cat. Schrodinger saw the following problem. The cat in the box would be both alive and not alive at the same time. The animal would be in this state for an hour, until someone opened the box and checked on the feline, either lifeless or very annoyed. One solution to this problem, known as the many worlds interpretation, gets around this situation by claiming that both outcomes take place. According to this hypothesis, all possible outcomes of quantum measurements occur across many universes, and their number might be infinite. It probably doesn't come as a surprise that this theory is often criticized. Many mention that this idea is unfalsifiable, since universes don't interact with one another, making the theory impossible to test. It's even been called one of the most implausible and unrealistic ideas ever. After all, it's not clear why your consciousness would get transferred between worlds just because you cease to exist in one of them. Unless it's a thought experiment, of course. It might provide you with the comfort of knowing that there is another you who doesn't pass away in a different world. But why should you believe that you only exist in the world where you're alive? What about the universe where you didn't make it? Like, what happens to your body? And speaking of the suggestion that you might understand that you're in a different universe thanks to Mandela effects, it's kind of the area of science fiction. We've never sneaked a peek beyond the edge of the observable universe. What lies there? If we managed to get there, would we find another universe? What if the universe we live in is just one of billions of trillions of other universes? I'm talking about the concept of a multiverse now. Look, there's this idea of parallel universes. Let's take one of them. It looks exactly the same as our universe, and still, some details differ. 
Maybe instead of becoming a doctor, you chose to start a music band there. Maybe one infamous asteroid changed its trajectory, and dinos are still roaming Earth in that universe. But the multiverse theory takes it all one step further. Those who believe in it state that there might be countless realities. According to this theory, we live in a bubble that is just one of many other bubbles, which I guess looks like bath foam. These bubbles constantly bob up and vanish. Multiverses are described by a few scientific theories, which mention various possible scenarios, from separate universes that keep springing into existence all the time, to regions of space that are in different planes than our home universe. But there's one thing these theories agree upon. All of them suggest that the space and time we observe is not the only reality. You see, it's impossible to explain all the quirks of our universe if it's the only one to exist. So it's either inventing newer theories that can throw light on certain properties of our universe, or accepting the fact that we're living in just one of many, many universes, all of which are different. One of the most widely known multiverse theories is called inflationary cosmology. This is the idea that right after the Big Bang, the universe expanded rapidly and exponentially. Indeed, cosmic inflation does explain lots of the properties of the universe we observe. For example, the distribution of galaxies. When this theory was suggested for the first time, it was perceived as a piece of science fiction. But it can indeed explain tons of interesting features of the world we live in. So with time, people started taking it seriously. Now, the theory states that inflation might happen again and again, maybe even infinitely. And this could create constellations of bubble universes. Of course, none of these bubbles will have the same properties as ours. There may easily be places where physics as we know it doesn't exist. But even though some of these universes might look like ours, they all lie beyond the realm we can observe directly. Another theory, called the Many Worlds Interpretation, claims that there might be multiple branching timelines, or alternative realities. And in each of those realities, our decisions play out differently, which also means very different outcomes. At the same time, the only reality you can perceive is the one where you live. If it's true, then the question is, where are all those other universes? Well, they most likely all overlap in dimensions we absolutely can't access. And at the moment, it's not possible to travel between universes. But who knows? Maybe a few thousand years later, people will not only find a way to prove that parallel universes exist, but also invent a method to hop from one of them to another. Unfortunately, so far, there's no solid evidence that multiverses exist. All the proof we've got today is purely theoretical. Some experts even argue that it could be an unbelievable cosmic coincidence that the Big Bang created such a perfectly balanced universe as ours. Or, if parallel universes do exist, we might have just inhabited the one that had all the right conditions for our survival. It's still unclear whether the multiverse theory is even testable. Perhaps we just haven't thought of the right tests yet. Now, I've got one scary thought for you to consider. What if, at one point, you stopped existing in your home universe, the one you were born into? What if your consciousness was transported to a parallel universe where you're now watching this video? Think of this. Chances are, we're going to find life beyond Earth by 2035, and there's no need to travel to a galaxy far, far away. Our Milky Way galaxy is full of totally suitable environments. Don't get too hyped up, though. We're talking about microbes or chemical markers, not Hollywood-like green humanoids. Even so, when we finally find traces of life, it will change how we see our place in the universe. NASA's Kepler Space Telescope discovered something incredible. Almost every star has planets, and many of these planets might be habitable. Rocky planets like Earth and Mars are even more common in our galaxy than gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter. Also, we already know that our galaxy is very rich in water. There's water in interstellar clouds where stars and planets form, in the debris disks around other stars, in comets, just everywhere. What's really hard, though, is finding life itself. Ideally, to finally find it, we need to land on every single planet out there and literally check under each rock. But thanks to the newest research, we can at least narrow down the search to potentially habitable worlds. The James Webb Space Telescope, 
a super powerful telescope that was launched into space in 2021, is onto this. It checks the atmospheres of nearby super Earths, rocky planets that are a bit bigger than Earth. It searches for life related gases, chemicals that can only be produced by living things. And they already found some clues. For example, they detected signs of such a chemical on a planet called K218b. This planet is 120 light years away, which is pretty close on a space scale. This planet is in the Goldilocks zone, which means a zone around the star where the temperatures are just right for liquid water to exist. It orbits a red dwarf star, the smallest type of star there is. Such stars are a bit fainter than our sun. It will take about a year to check if these hints of life are real. If so, it would mean that life is much more common than we previously thought. But even if it's not, there are 10 more Goldilocks planets on their list to study. The James Webb Space Telescope is a very cool tool, but it has limits. It can't detect small, Earth-like planets due to their size. To fix this, NASA plans to launch another tool, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. This one will be even better at spotting such planets and life-related chemicals. And also, we have the SETI project. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. This project has been on a hunt for extraterrestrial creatures since the 1980s. They also believe that we'll find signs of life within the next 10 years. Not so long ago, they started a super big and cool project. It's called COSMIC, and it uses an array of radio telescopes in New Mexico. You might have seen those in the movie Contact. COSMIC allows scientists to listen to hundreds of thousands and potentially millions of star systems at the same time. If there are any interesting signals, scientists can check them right away, instead of waiting for weeks or even months. The signals themselves are often very sudden and short, but COSMIC can detect even the shortest ones that last nanoseconds. COSMIC can also help with other research, like studying mysterious and unexplained fast radio bursts, or even dark matter. This is the biggest and most powerful tool for searching for extraterrestrial life we've ever created. But it's not enough to just listen. Why don't we reach out ourselves? NASA has sent some signals into deep space. In 2002, their deep space network sent a signal to the Pioneer 10 satellite. But there was an obstacle in the path. A white dwarf star, 27 light years away from Earth. If there's a planet around this star, perhaps the signal reached them too. If there are any intelligent species there, we could receive a reply by 2029. The DSN keeps sending powerful transmissions into space. These signals will bump into 222 stars within the next three centuries. Maybe someday we'll receive a reply from somewhere far away. But why haven't we received a response yet? There are about 200 billion galaxies in the universe, each with around 100 billion stars. If just 1% of those stars had one planet, that's still 200 quintillion possible planets. And we can narrow it down even further. If the chance of them having life is one in a trillion, that would still leave us a few hundred thousand planets. So, where is everyone? This is a famous question known as the Fermi Paradox. The first possibility isn't that terrifying. It's possible that the universe is full of life, but this life isn't intelligent in our traditional sense. Some planets might have microbes, birds, or space dinosaurs. This is called the Great Filter Theory. It suggests that there are certain filters that life has to overcome in order to become intelligent, and maybe other species just haven't overcome them yet. Think about it. Life on Earth started in the ocean, then crawled onto land, diversified into many forms, went extinct in massive events five times, evolved again, and eventually led to humans. We built societies, developed healthcare, and only then started searching for another life. There's another idea called the Gaian bottleneck hypothesis, which suggests basically the same thing. While it might not be too hard for basic life to start, it's incredibly tough for that life to survive and thrive over long periods. 
Venus might have had oceans and Earth-like conditions too, but something went wrong. Its oceans boiled away because of a runaway greenhouse effect. Now it's sterile. Mars also had liquid water on its surface once, and both the Moon and Mercury had thick atmospheres for a short time. Meanwhile, Earth has had liquid water on its surface for almost its entire existence. It's super rare and remarkable for a planet to hold temperatures from 32 to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for millions of years. So, maybe it's a mistake to look for intelligent life, especially the one that uses the same technology as we do. It evolved under completely different conditions after all. That's also where the so-called Drake Equation comes in. It's a formula that gives us a chance to calculate the potential of life becoming intelligent on a planet. To calculate the result, we need to know several variables. How many stars there are, how many of them have planets, the chance of these planets having life, and so on. Unfortunately, we don't know these numbers yet, and the result might be insignificant. But let's assume that there is at least one other intelligent species. Why haven't we met yet? There might be many reasons. Maybe they don't think we're interesting enough, or maybe the problem is with us. Perhaps we keep missing their signals, or maybe we miss the entire species itself. The universe is insanely huge and ancient. It's over 14 billion years old. If we compress Earth's entire evolutionary history into a 24-hour day, life starts at 4 a.m. Dinosaurs go extinct at 11.40 p.m. Human-like creatures appear two minutes before midnight. In this analogy, humans have existed for just 77 seconds, and our technology capable of detecting extraterrestrial life is even newer, less than a second. With such vast distances and time spans, the chances of us existing at the same time as other civilizations are slim. If their civilization lasted only a few millennia, we could easily miss them entirely. But that doesn't mean we should give up our search. Scientists were worried that Earth's radio signals had dimmed over time. But a recent study showed that it's actually the opposite. The numbers of our satellites keeps growing, and this makes our planet more detectable. By the end of the decade, we could have 100,000 satellites, making Earth incredibly bright in the radio spectrum. If there is an advanced civilization out there, they will easily spot us even from very far distances. Astronomers are super optimistic about it. There is a high chance they'll find extraterrestrial creatures while you and I are still around. Very recently, astronomers have found three potential super-Earth planets orbiting a somewhat close orange dwarf star. The term super-Earth is used to describe a planet beyond the solar system with a mass higher than that of Earth but below those of the ice giants of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune. An international team of researchers, led by Dr. Shweta Dalal from the University of Exeter, found that the exoplanets were orbiting star HD 48498, which is located around 55 light-years away from Earth. The planets travel around their star in 7, 38, and 151 Earth days, respectively. The study describing these findings appeared in the journal MINRAS on the 24th of June 2024. The coolest thing here is that the outermost exoplanet candidate orbits in the habitable zone of its host star, and the conditions there might be comfortable enough for liquid water to exist on the surface without boiling or freezing. Such habitable regions around stars are also known as the Goldilocks zone and are believed to be ideal for potentially supporting life. Another reason this discovery is so important is that the orange host star is like our Sun. But since it's an orange dwarf, it produces less radiation than our yellow dwarf star. It's also the closest planetary system to host a super-Earth in the habitable zone of a Sun-like star, which makes this discovery super exciting. It can help us move forward in our quest to locate habitable planets around solar-type stars. Who knows? Maybe this planet will be our new home one day. These potential super-Earths were detected thanks to the HARPS and Rocky Planet Search Program. Throughout a decade, the team taking part in this research has collected nearly 190 high-precision measurements using special equipment. By analyzing the spectrum of light coming from a star, 
Astronomers can figure out whether it's moving toward us, this is known as blue shift, or away from us, that's what we call red shift. And still, to make sure their findings were correct, the team used lots of different methods and comparative analysis. Everything confirmed their conclusions. There, indeed, are three planetary candidates with minimum masses ranging from 5 to 11 times the mass of our home planet. The team also believes that the proximity of the star, together with the outermost planet's favorable orbit, can make this system a great target for future studies. Hopefully, further research will open doors for our understanding of planetary systems and the potential of life outside our solar system. Scientists have already discovered more than 5,000 exoplanets, which are planets outside the solar system, since the first such world was confirmed orbiting a sun-like star in 1995. To find those distant planets, astronomers use different equipment, like NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, launched in 2009. Its mission was to find as many Earth-like planets dwelling in the Milky Way galaxy as possible. But it's not the only instrument used for searching exoplanets. Anyway, now let's look at the most exciting and promising of these worlds. Gliese 667 cc is a mere 22 light years from Earth. But even though it seems close, it's still around 129 trillion miles away from us. The planet itself is around 3.8 times as massive as Earth and completes one orbit around its host star within 28 days. In other words, a year on that Earth-like planet is 13 times shorter than a year on our planet. Luckily, the star is a cool red dwarf, so the exoplanet most likely lies in its habitable zone. But there's still a chance that this world might be regularly baked by the flares coming from its parent star, which is not cool on many different levels. <laughs> Kepler 22b is way further away than the previous world, more than 600 light years away from our planet. It was the very first Kepler planet found in the habitable zone of its star. This world is larger than Earth, it's about 2.4 times our planet's size. Sadly, we still don't know whether this planet is rocky, liquid, or gaseous. The orbit of Kepler 22b is similar to Earth's. It takes the planet 290 days to orbit its G-class star, which is kind of like our Sun. But this star is smaller and colder than ours. Another Kepler planet, this time it's Kepler 69c. It lies a whopping 2,700 light years away from us. This world is also almost 70% larger than Earth. Researchers know nothing about its composition, but they found out that the planet needs 240 days to complete one orbit. This makes its position in its system like that of Venus in our solar system. At the same time, this world might be more habitable than Venus since its host star is a bit less luminous, 80% of our Sun. TOI 733b is a recently discovered world. It was found in 2023. It's out there, 245 light years away from Earth, and needs just 4.9 Earth days to complete an orbit around its star. But the coolest thing about this planet is that it might have a massive ocean. According to scientists, the planet is likely to be completely covered with water. Does that mean there could be life on the super-Earth? Time will tell. GJ1214b is located 48 light-years from Earth. This planet is a super-Earth, almost three times bigger in diameter and eight times heavier than our home. It orbits around its red dwarf star faster than you can binge-watch your favorite series, finishing a complete loop every 38 hours. But it's not just the planet's size or orbit that's out of this world. It's pretty hot out there, with mind-melting 450 degrees Fahrenheit. But the coolest thing is that this planet is practically drowning in water. The sizzling temperatures and crazy high pressures on JG1214b create some cool materials like hot ice and superfluid water. Superfluidity is something that happens in liquid helium when it's almost as cold as it can get. On Earth, water totally missed the memo about being superfluid because it needs ridiculously low temperatures and off-the-chart pressures to pull off that trip. Still, there's not much use in superfluid water. Even if you try it, you'll just get dehydrated. The super-Earth that's closest to us was discovered in 2016, and it's called Proxima Centauri b. It's located a mere 4 light-years away from Earth and has a mass remarkably similar to that of our planet. 
A year on Proxima Centauri b is short. It only takes the planet 11.2 days to complete a circle around its central star. Scientists discovered this world after they noticed that its parent star was slightly wobbling. They hadn't been sure what exactly had been happening there until they realized Proxima Centauri b's gravity probably produced pulls and tugs that caused these wobbles. Although the exoplanet is traveling in the habitable zone of its star, Proxima Centauri, it is exposed to extreme ultraviolet radiation, all because it lies very close to its parent star. Also, none of the telescopes that are currently working and exploring exoplanets are positioned well enough to capture the light from the atmosphere of this super-Earth. Most things there are still a mystery to us, even though we're talking about a planet that's really close. Super-Earth TOI 715b orbits a red dwarf, a star smaller and cooler than our Sun. At the moment, such stars remain prime candidates for finding habitable planets orbiting them. Those miniature rocky worlds have far closer orbits than those circling around stars like our Sun. But since red dwarfs are small and cool, the planets don't risk anything when crowding closer. They're still safely within a star's habitable zone. Experts say that TOI 715b might have once had an atmosphere thicker than that of Neptune, and now the planet could be in a transition state where it's losing its atmosphere. To confirm this suspicion, scientists need to do more research, and they might finally learn whether this planet is a watery terrestrial planet. It was 1994. It was dark, so no one saw two silhouettes opening the emergency exits of a glass dome complex in Arizona, known as Biosphere 2. They were determined to free seven people locked inside for a month, risking their lives in the name of science. The mission was accomplished, but they got hit with trespassing and vandalism charges. The vandals were Abigail Ayling and Mark Van Fillo. They were among the first eight poor devils who lived in that place as guinea pigs. And they didn't want anyone else to go through the same horrors they had experienced. $150 million were spent to see if humans could create suitable living conditions on other planets, like Mars. To do this, scientists built a mini-world with over 3,000 species of plants and animals. Biosphere 2 was a sealed-off 3-acre habitat, complete with its own mini-rainforest, a private beach with a coral reef, a grassland savanna, a marsh, and even a desert. Between 1991 and 1993, nothing could enter or exit that place. The group of eight people locked inside called themselves Biospherians, rocking matching Star Trek-like jumpsuits, growing their own food, and breathing their own air. They began with high hopes and a five-star hotel-style breakfast, but things took a darker turn over the months. The whole team was starving and turning orange. In Biosphere 1, which is the real Earth, you can order a pizza in two minutes. But inside Biosphere 2, it took them an endless four months to whip up a margarita-style pie. They had to harvest wheat for the dough and milk goats for the cheese. The goal was to be completely self-sufficient, and they became part of an atmosphere, quite literally. When they breathed out, their CO2 fed the sweet potatoes they were growing. And those sweet potatoes became part of them since they were essentially eating the same carbons over and over again. They had so many sweet potato feasts that their skin actually turned orange from all the excess beta-carotene. What seemed like a funny situation at the time highlighted a big issue. The crop yields in Biosphere 2 were a total disappointment, and the crew was starving. They were going crazy from hunger, and moments of sudden anger led to doing regrettable things, like stealing bananas from the basement storeroom. At some point, the freezer had to be locked. Over the first six months, each of them lost between 18 and 58 pounds of weight. Every day, someone took charge of weighing out fresh food for the cook, logging the information about nutrients into the computer to make sure the crew hit their recommended calorie, protein, and fat goals. Initially, meals were served buffet-style, but as the crew got hungrier, the cook started to meticulously divide their food into equal portions. Their diet, mostly sweet potatoes, carrots, fruits, and occasional meat on Sundays, were supposed to keep them going during those exhausting 80-hour work weeks of heavy physical labor. Biospherians were leaving every meal still hungry, and they had recurring dreams of McDonald's hamburgers, sushi, Snickers bars, and cheesecake. The air was running out. The entire place was completely sealed, 
with steel and glass at the top and a solid steel floor underneath. Managers made sure to check everything coming in to avoid synthetic materials emitting harmful gases. Living areas were furnished with wood and wool, and they couldn't use chemical deodorants or blow out birthday candles. Biospherians were counting on the food they grew and their many rainforests to produce enough oxygen for them to survive. However, they were losing oxygen very fast, drowning in their own carbon dioxide emissions, and worst of all, they had no idea why. With another 9 months of the experiment to go, oxygen levels had dropped from 21% to around 15%, which feels like living at the top of Mount Fuji. They felt awful, basically dragging themselves around the biosphere. They couldn't even finish a sentence without stopping to catch a breath. Then sleep apnea kicked in, with some of them waking up gasping for air. To bring down the carbon levels inside Biosphere 2, they tried some desperate moves, like growing plants like crazy, cutting back on watering the soil as much as possible, and even giving up on tilling. Nothing worked. So everyone decided they had hit a dangerously low point and asked for help. Refrigerated trucks showed up to pump more pure oxygen into Biosphere 2. As soon as the gas started flowing in, they burst out laughing and began running around. The ecosystem was a total mess. Hummingbirds and honeybees vanished after a couple of months, so plants weren't getting pollinated anymore. Worms and broad mites attacked crops, and cockroaches just took over. Four species of cockroaches were brought inside to recycle organic matter. But the regular household cockroach was the ultimate survivor. They somehow sneaked in and multiplied, becoming a serious threat to crops. At night, the kitchen got flooded with cockroaches as soon as the lights went out. To combat the infestation, the group greased coffee mugs with lubricant and put pieces of papaya inside as bait. Roaches would climb inside, but they couldn't scale the slippery sides to escape. Being hungry, lacking oxygen, dealing with bug infestations, that's enough to make anyone go nuts. Heated arguments led to cups being thrown and people being spat at. Eventually, the whole group just split into two. They stopped talking and could walk right past one another in the hallways without even making eye contact. Half of them wanted more food and oxygen to continue the research with some dignity, while the other half believed in survival without external help, no matter the costs. The truth is, the sealed chamber had been breached long before that. Just two weeks after they got inside, a biospherian named Jane Pointer cut off the tip of her finger in a cooking accident while making rice. The mission's doctor tried sewing the tip back on, but it didn't work, and her finger turned black within days. She went to a hospital outside for surgery, and a couple hours later, she sneaked back inside, carrying a duffel bag filled with supplies like computer parts and color film. Reporters would only learn of that sneaky delivery months later, and because of that, many people have questioned the credibility of the entire experiment. Media treated the experiment like a reality show, branding it as trendy ecological entertainment. Headline news around the world made it sound as if they were on the brink of losing their lives, to the point where families were concerned, calling the biospherians to check if they were really okay. The group felt like they were in a human zoo with tourists coming from far away to peer into the glass cage. In the first six months alone, more than 150,000 people visited the place. Biosphere 2 ended up becoming a pop culture punchline, inspiring a comedy movie called Biodome and decades of funny sketches. You might be wondering why none of them quit the experiment and walked out the front door. Well, none of the environmentalists wanted to be the first to admit it was too much to handle. Plus, they were all still hopeful they could somehow crack the puzzle of building Earth number 2. By the end, they had managed to find 7 tons of missing oxygen. It had been absorbed by the concrete. Even though being breathless all the time might seem like the biggest challenge they face, the Biosphere said that learning how to deal with people in a closed environment was even harder. It looks like the experiment was a huge failure, but the group did learn a lot of valuable lessons. They proved that a sealed ecosystem could work for years. They contributed to studies on reef restoration, and their farms showed that high productivity and full nutrient recycling could be achieved without toxic chemicals. In case you wonder, this wasn't the end of the glass complex. The second mission inside Biosphere 2 took place in March 1994. Now you can go back to the beginning of the video to understand how that worked out.